Aloha, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this week's edition of Condo Insider brought to you by Think Tank Hawaii. This week, we will be discussing operating budgets for your associations. Uh, it is that time of year where associations start to process and prepare uh, for their next fiscal year. So it is a busy time of year. Uh, and if you have not already started to do so, it's probably a good time to start thinking about your 2022 operating budget and reserve study. Uh, that being said, uh, we will be diving into the operating budget side of your association a little bit today. So we will touch a, a little bit on the basics of a reserve, excuse me, of a budget. So what is a budget, uh, first of all? Well, a budget is an estimate of income and expenditures for a set period of time, essentially. Uh, generally speaking, for associations, that set period of time is 12 months or one year. Most associations in Hawaii uh, have a calendar year or a fiscal year that starts on January 1. However, there are other associations out there that do have fiscal years that may start on September 1 or July 1. So there are some associations out there that do have different fiscal years. But I would say a large majority of the associations in the state of Hawaii, the fiscal year matches your calendar year where it starts on January 1. That being said, in the association world, uh, we utilize the zero-based budgeting uh, process when preparing association budgets. So zero-based budgeting is a method that has you essentially allocate all of your money to expenses and savings and sometimes some debt service, depending on your association. And the goal is that your income uh, will essentially offset all of your expenditures. So essentially your income minus your expenditures will equal zero or will balance out to zero at the bottom line. So whatever amount of money you are collecting on a monthly basis essentially is designated or designed to cover your monthly expenditures. That being said, uh, when we look at a reserve, excuse me, uh, an operating budget, uh, we look at a couple of different aspects. Uh, we look at our revenues and we look at our expenditures. So we'll touch on revenues uh, briefly first. So in the association world, we're kind of limited on the different uh, revenue sources that are available to different associations. I would probably say, obviously, most associations uh, collect their revenue through monthly maintenance fees that they assess to the, their home ownership on a monthly basis, either via a payment coupon or a monthly billing statement. So a, a large, the largest portion, probably almost close to 100% of revenues uh, is collected through maintenance fees. However, uh, depending on your association, you may have some other sources of income. For example, your association may have a resident manager unit that is not utilized by your resident manager. And therefore your association is renting that manager's unit out on a monthly basis to some other resident. So that is a potential source of income or of revenue uh, above and beyond your regular maintenance fees. Another potential source of income, depending on your asso association, is your parking income. There are a number of associations out there that have uh, parking lots uh, and units that actually don't have a parking stall designated to the unit. When that occurs, oftentimes those entire parking structures, those parking lots, are rented out on a monthly basis to the residents of that uh, association. That being said, the rental income through your, your association owned unit, your parking income are a couple sources of revenue. Uh, another source of revenue that many associations uh, utilize when they install sub meters uh, for either electricity or possibly water and sewer. Uh, and therefore becomes a billable event because their individual electricity usage and possibly water usage is being metered. And therefore, the amount that is being utilized on the residential side or portion of the uh, budget, budget uh, is basically reimbursed from the homeowners based on their submeters. I would probably say most associations don't have actual water submeters because it is difficult to submeter water depending on the makeup or infrastructure of your building. However, it is becoming more and more common that associations do submeter electricity. 
Uh, it is a, it's a green uh, approach to try and minimize the amount of electricity that associations are utilizing. Some other sources of revenue that some associations are able to benefit from are rooftop rentals. For example, we have these major cell phone companies that will go around and they will basically uh, lease portions of rooftops of different associations in order to uh, basically provide cell phone service uh, throughout the state. We have actually seen quite a bit of increase or modernization to these cell phone tower equipment uh, with the implementation of 5G. So that is another potential source of income depending on your association. Uh, and it's something that you may want to investigate if, if that uh, option does come your way. Some associations do have uh, some other minor fees that they may implement, uh, such as a fee to utilize the barbecues uh, or a fee to reserve the elevator for move-ins, move-outs. Uh, generally speaking, these fees are very minimal and really don't provide a significant difference in the amount of money the association needs to collect through maintenance fees. Uh, another source of income for associations is interest income. That being said, though, it's important to understand that your interest income, you need to really take a look at your reserve study because it's most likely that your reserve study is uh, already factoring that additional revenue for your reserve fund. That being said, I do see a somewhat on a somewhat regular basis where associations make that mistake where their reserve study basically is budgeting the interest income that will be allocated or deposited into the reserve account. And they will also budget the interest income under the operating side. And therefore they're essentially double counting that revenue source. So you really gotta keep a close eye on the interest in income because most times your reserve study is already factoring uh, interest income rate. According to Hawaii Administrative Rules, uh, Section 16, associations need to basically make an assumption when they're preparing the reserve study about what the interest income will be. So take a close look at your revenue line items and take a close look at, at your reserve study and make sure that you are not double counting your interest income because, again, your reserve study is likely already factoring or counting for that interest income. So make sure you are not adding the interest income to cover operational expenditures because it is a fund or is amount of money that should be deposited into your reserve account and not into your operating account. That being said, uh, those are pretty much the main sources of revenue uh, in the association world. The, the association world essentially are nonprofit organizations. So you're essentially collecting as much maintenance fees as required to cover your operational expenditures and to cover your reserve contribution. Moving on to the expense side of your operating budget, there are essentially two uh, classes of expenditures. Number one, uh, you have discretionary expenditures, and number two, you have your mandatory expenditures. So let's first touch on your discretionary expenditures. So discretionary expenditures, basically you have a little bit more flexibility on whether or not you really need that expenditure or whether uh, you can kind of control the amount of money that you're spending uh, in those discretionary line items. Unfortunately, in the association world, the discretionary expenditure line items, they're, they're, they're not that many. Most associations uh, have more mandatory, mandatory expenditure, expenditure line items rather than discretionary line items. However, uh, a discretionary line item uh, can be controlled. Uh, for example, maybe the number of employees that your association uh, uh, hires. Uh, maybe you guys will decide to hire eight employees rather than nine, uh, or maybe you will uh, decide to hire nine rather than eight. Uh, so you do have some flexibility in how much money you expend on certain line items, for example, like your employees. The benefits that you offer to your employees, do you offer a 401k matching program or retirement programs? Those are discretionary items that are really up to the board and whether the board will decide to uh, include those discretionary expenditures in your operating budget. There are some service contracts or maintenance contracts 
uh, that they may not be discretionary, but you still have some flexibility in regards to the frequency uh, of services. For example, I happen to know of an association that they have a semi-annual roof maintenance uh, plan with their roofing company. Now they do it on a semi-annual basis because they essentially they have two roofing systems. They have the residential tower roof, and then they have a roof that essentially covers the commercial unit on the ground floor. So the top of the ground floor roof is very visible when looking down from the residential tower. And if it's not maintained on a regular basis, power wash on a regular basis, maybe coated on, you know, in the uh, areas that need coating on a regular basis, it, det- it tends to be um, aesthetically un- unpleasing when it builds up with dirt or debris. So that's kind of a discretionary expenditure that associations may choose uh, to spend more money to have the frequency increase due to aesthetic reasons. Now, there may be some, uh, on the flip side, they may decide to have an annual service once a year rather than twice a year, similar with window washing. Uh, again, that's kind of a line item that has a little bit more discretion depending on your building. Maybe rather than doing a quarterly window washing, you may go to three times a year or, or a semi-annual. You know, you're really going to have to understand your ownership and what the desire is, uh, what the complaints you may be hearing are from your ownership. So. Window washing might be another option or uh, or possibility where you can increase or decrease uh, the frequency of that. And that basically has a direct correlation on the amount of money that you need to spend for that line item. Uh, Another one that I see on a regular basis uh, in regards to uh, ownership classes uh, in an association is the temperature of your pool. You know, I, I hear there are groups that like a hot or warmer water than those that maybe do lap swimming. But again, that is kind of an expenditure or a component of a line item that you can control uh, in order to either slightly decrease that expenditure line item or possibly increase, depending on on the the path that you take. So again, the discretionary line items are more more flexible. You may or may not need them in your, your operating budget. Uh, or you just, you know, you uh, tweak the frequency of the, the currents on those service contracts. So that's this discretionary expenses. And now you have your mandatory expenses. Uh, and you really have no option in regards to paying your mandatory expenses. Uh, for example, you have to pay your utility bills. You have to pay your, electric, your electricity, your water, your sewer. If you don't pay those items, your water gets shuts off or your electricity gets turned off. So those, that's an example of a mandatory expenditure that you have to pay. Uh, and you will find through your governing documents and state statute for that matter, that associations are required to carry insurance. So insurance is another mandatory expenditure that associations need to budget accordingly. You do, we did touch on some service contracts under the discretionary uh, side of things like the window washing, the roof maintenance, pool heat, things like that. However, there are also service contracts that are absolutely mandatory. For example, if you live in a high rise or if your association has an elevator, you need to make sure that that elevator is on a maintenance contract uh, in order to make sure that that elevator remains operational all of the time. Uh, It would, They'd be very difficult for homeowners uh, if you lived in a 20-story building and uh, unfortunately uh, you uh, did not maintain your elevator properly uh, and therefore it was broken down, making people walk up and down. So that is a, a service contract that, in my opinion, is a mandatory service contract. Another example of a mandatory service contract would be like your refuse service that you have or utilize to pick up your Uh, refuse uh, on a daily basis or a a three times a week basis. So those are some examples of a a service contract that are considered to be mandatory. Another item that is mandatory and is determined by a reserve study is your reserve contribution. Through Hawaii statute, associations are obligated to fund your reserves to meet your future financial obligations. So you do have a mandatory expenditure or basically a transfer from your operating account to your reserve account that you need to budget for accordingly. So those are basically the two different types of expenditures, your discretionary expenses and your mandatory expenses. 
Uh, that being said, uh, we are just going to take a short break. Aloha. I'm Mitch Ewan, host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy on ThinkTech Hawaii. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, is about following the many clean energy initiatives in Hawaii. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, appears weekly on ThinkTech Hawaii at 4 p.m. on Wednesdays. Thank you so much for watching our show. We'll see you then. Aloha. Great. Uh, welcome back uh, to Condo Insider, brought to you by Think Tank Hawaii. My name is Jonathan Billings, and we're talking about uh, association operating budgets. Uh, we've touched on the basic basics of your operating budget. Uh, we touched on the zero-based budgeting process that we follow. Uh, we looked at your revenue sources uh, and the two different uh, types of expenditures that you have in your operating budget. Now, that being said, uh, there are some other expenditures that you may want to consider adding to your reserve study. Uh, as you are likely aware, the association industry is being hit very hard currently with insurance premiums, insurance rates. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of loss or payouts that the associate, excuse me, the insurance companies have had to pay over the last number of years, and it directly affects the amount of premium that your association pays for your insurance coverage. That being said, uh, in my position, uh, when I go out to solicit in, um, insurance proposals from different companies, I am finding more and more often now that insurance carriers are requiring uh, property managers or managing agents to fill out questionnaires. And in those questionnaires, they will have questions like, how often or what is the frequency that you clean out your waste stacks? What is the frequency or how often do you uh, inspect your rooftop? Um, what is the frequency that you are cleaning your electrical equipment? So insur the insurance companies basically are doing more due diligence or they're doing their homework more in regards to what kind of maintenance programs does your association have in place that essentially should minimize the amount of loss that your association has. So that being said, considering that insurance companies are asking managing agents to complete these questionnaires, you may consider being proactive and get some of these components on maintenance programs. So when your managing agent is filling out these questionnaires, they can answer, yes, we are on a regular maintenance program for your waste stack cleaning, or yes, we are on a regular maintenance program for your roof coating system, uh, or yes, we are on a regular maintenance program for your electrical distribution uh, system. So those are some maintenance programs that you may not currently have in place that you may want to consider putting in place uh, in order to hopefully improve your insurance premiums. Uh, so just a little food for that, a little food for thought there just to consider. Uh, just moving on. So, you know, like I said, we're, we're entering the budget season and then a question I get someone on a regular basis, you know, who should be involved uh, in regards to uh, your budget and what do we really need to look at uh, in your budget. So that being said, it's a zero-based budget. So what you're going to want to do, uh, a committee, the treasurer, your managing agent, on-site management, you're going to want to review your different contracts you have in place, your refuse contract, your elevator contract, your security contract, things like that. Because oftentimes you will see in those contracts that they have escalation clauses, or they have clauses that they can increase a certain percentage on an annual basis. So when you're doing your budgeting, uh, you basically already know what the cap will be for the increase on those specific components or the specific maintenance contracts. So you're really going to want to take a close look at your, your contracts when you're doing your budget. You're going to want to look at your historical usage of your electricity, uh, your water, your sewer. You don't really want to pay attention to the dollar amount necessarily, for example, electricity, it goes, it fluctuates up and down with the price of oil. You really want to look at the actual kilowatt usage uh, that you have been utilizing and use that as your average when you're factoring uh, your association's expense line item for your electrical uh, expenditure line. Uh, so you're going to want to look at your utilities, look at the historical peaks and valleys. Obviously in the summertime, Oftentimes I see the, that the electricity usage peaks in the summer because everybody's running their air conditioning, where in the winter time, the electricity is uh, not as high as the summer months because people have stopped using their air conditioning in the winter time. You are gonna wanna reach out to some of your contractors and ask them, do they anticipate any kind of a potential increase? 
reach out to your insurance agent, uh, use them as a source. So when you're doing your budget and you're trying to factor, basically estimate what your insurance premiums are going to be, reach out to the resources that you have available to you, reach out to your insurance agent, reach out, reach out to your vendors, uh, pick their brain on what they anticipate uh, the potential increases will be over that next fiscal year. Take a look uh, at your reserve study. Uh, does your reserve study schedule an increase for fiscal year 2022? I do know that a lot of associations did postpone a 2021 increase due to COVID-19. That being said, you, know, you need to make sure that you pay attention to your reserve study and what the required reserve contribution will be for 2022. It is likely that you will be required to increase your reserve contribution if you did postpone an increase in 2021 to basically uh, lessen the financial burden or ease the financial burden on your homeowners during COVID-19. Uh, you really should be looking, not only should you be doing an average of like, say 12 months, but you really should go back a couple of years. Because sometimes you will see that there's patterns where there might be an every other year expenditure. For example, in uh, fiscal year 2021, associations were required to complete the uh, biannual uh, kind of registration uh, through the uh, DCCA. Now, that's not an annual expenditure, so that's not going to hit every single year. So in 2022, you do not have to factor for the, uh, the biannual condo, condo registration. However, in 2023, that is something you're going to have to remember to put into your operating budget. Uh, that being said, also, when you're preparing your reserve study, you're really going to want to tap into your on-site. Your on-site management really understands the details, really understands the ins and outs of your different components of your association. They have a better understanding of the current condition, let's say, of your booster pumps or some of your mechanical equipment and whether or not those pieces of equipment will need some kind of repair or upgrade uh, during that next fiscal year. So you're really going to want to tap into your on-site management, pick their brain uh, to better understand what the condition is of the components. In addition, that you really need to tap into your on-site management to determine wages for the next fiscal year. Does he or she have an employee that has been a, an all-star and is uh, deserving of a decent increase uh, versus maybe another employee that has been doing subpar work so you're really going to want to tap into your management to basically understand what kind of merit increases should be factored for your different employees at your association. Always keep in mind, associations or boards will sometimes brag that they have an increase in maintenance fees in three or four years. In my opinion, that's not something to brag about. Uh, and, and the reason being is because we know costs are increasing. Uh, you, get, you can see the news right now that the, the expectations of inflation are going to be skyrocketing or they're going to increase a, a fair amount uh, in the, the foreseeable future. So I am of the opinion, and I always recommend to the association that I'm involved with, that at a minimum, you should be increasing your maintenance fees at the rate of inflation. Uh, again, costs are increasing. Cost of labor goes up. Cost of oil fluctuates. Uh, inflation is going up. So in my opinion, it's not something to brag about if you have not increased your maintenance fees for a number of years, because then you are falling behind in regards to the, the rate of inflation. Um, that being said, uh, another consideration about not increasing maintenance fees is there are basically restrictions about uh, exceeding your budget by 20%. And if you exceed your budget by 20%, essentially you, the board or the association will need to get a resolution adopted by the ownership that basically authorized that, uh, that um, variance uh, in your operating budget. Moving on, who, who should be involved in the operating uh, budget process? I look at it as a, a two-phase process where the first phase, the managing agent uh, is involved or your property manager is heavily involved. Your on-site management is involved because they know the association, the ins and outs of the association. Phase one, uh, tends to include the board treasurer and board president uh, of the association. Uh, and I do see so associations on a somewhat regular basis also form budget committees. So I, again, I look at it as a, as a two-phase approach. The, the phase one is more of getting into the details, really getting to the nitty-gritty of your operating budget with a select number of people. And once you're 
past that point and you basically have a draft operating budget available for review, from that point, it goes into the phase two process, in my opinion, where the treasurer uh, presents the operating budget either to a committee or to the budget, excuse me, or to the board of directors for review and consideration. Um, the phase two is where the entire board gets involved. Uh, they may have some questions for the managing agent or the treasurer and basically ask how they came up with certain expectations. I would say that it is important that an association and a board understand every single line item. Uh, so take some time on your operating budget. Generally speaking, uh, I would recommend that you actually uh, present the operating budget, uh, let's say in August or September, not approve it, that will basically give the board members a month to review that document. And then at the following meeting in September or October, actually have that budget approved by your association. Uh, always be mindful of statutory requirements and requirements uh, that are uh, explained in your governing documents. For example, statutory requirement basically states that if you have an increase in maintenance fees, uh, you need to provide notice to the ownership 30 days in advance of a maintenance fee increase. There are several governing documents out there, bylaws that even put a, a more stringent requirement and require a 60 day notice of, a, or of, a, of an increase in maintenance fee. So make sure you understand what your governing documents specifically say, whether or not you need a 30 day notice per statute or whether or not your bylaws require a 60 day notice. So Make sure you review that uh, so you have a clear understanding of what your documents require. I would say, uh, again, just being in the management industry, I would say don't wait until November uh, to approve your budget. And why is that? You have to understand once that budget is approved, your managing agent needs to go back to their uh, office and go back to a, their accounting uh, department. And the accounting department basically needs to import or input uh, the budget into their accounting software in order to produce your, your financials in order, in order to produce payment coupons or payment statements. So there is a process involved on the management level or at your managing agent that has quite a bit of legwork in order to provide those payment coupons and those billing statements to your homeowners. So by approving it last minute, uh, you might be uh, late in line uh, where there are the other association that essentially approved their budget prior to you. Um, there, I do see uh, sometimes uh, on a regular basis when you are in budget season, you are constantly running your printer. I mean, it runs all day long for the entire day because you're printing thousands and thousands of pages uh, to send out these operating budgets to your uh, ownership. So that being said, those printers, uh, they have issues. They can overheat. They may break down. So if you're approving it in November, mid-November, late November, you might run into some obstructions or obstacles that may delay the delivery of your operating budget to the ownership and therefore may not actually be complying uh, with state statute. Uh, so again, I would just highly recommend don't wait until November uh, if you have a January 1 fiscal year to approve your operating budget. Make sure you have a couple month buffer in there uh, in order to give your managing agent sufficient time uh, to prepare, uh, to print, uh, to stuff the envelopes, to prepare the payment coupons, the billing statements, uh, in order to ensure that you meet your obligation through state statute or your governing documents. Uh, again, as I just previously stated, I would I recommend uh, that the initial budget be presented to the board of directors uh, in the August or September board meeting. Uh, if you have monthly meetings, if you don't have monthly meetings, you may even have to be sooner. Just it really depends on your, the schedule of your meeting. So, if you have monthly meetings, I recommend that be done. The initial presentation be done in August or September because that will still give you one additional meeting. Uh, where you can uh, give it the final review and get the final approval from the board of directors. Uh, that being said, uh, that's uh, about it. Uh, again, <clears throat> have a clear understanding of your governing documents. Uh, look at potential other revenue sources if they are available, oftentimes they're not. Look at your discretionary expenditures and your mandatory expenditures. 
uh, engage your on-site management. Again, they are key during the budgeting process. Uh, work hand in hand with your managing agent, your treasurer. Um, it is budget season. Good luck to everybody. Uh, spend some time on your budget, spend some time on your reserve study, uh, and uh, good luck and happy fiscal 2022. Aloha.